Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Katie Peace. I'm the Director of Communications for the Preservation League of New York State. And we are so excited to have you here to talk about land banks, preservation, and affordable housing. Um, for those of you who maybe have made it to this presentation without being familiar with the League, I will give you just a very brief overview of who we are. Uh, we're a New York statewide nonprofit focused on investing in people and projects that champion the essential role of preservation in community revitalization, sustainable economic growth, and the protection of our historic buildings and landscapes. We do this through a bunch of different programs, including technical services, grant making, including our signature grant programs, Preserve New York and Technical Assistance Grants, which are partnerships between the League and the New York State Council on the Arts, our Seven to Save program of endangered historic sites throughout the state, our Excellence in Historic Preservation Awards, which we are currently accepting nominations for at this moment. So bookmark that if you have a great project, um, public policy and advocacy that we do at local, state, and federal levels, and our Endangered Pro Properties Intervention Program loans. And we also do public programming like this one. Um, and so today we are really excited to be talking about affordable housing. The housing crisis is a major problem in New York and all over the country. And when we talk about preservation in terms of helping to build strong, resilient, sustainable communities, affordable housing absolutely has to be part of that conversation. So we're really excited to welcome our panel today. We're gonna to be joined by Caroline Chong, who is an assistant professor of history at the University of Central Florida. Her research spans historic preservation and economic development, focusing on the relationship between urban heritage con conservation, urban regeneration, and poverty reduction. I saw Caroline speak a few months ago at UMD's uh, Recentering the Margin Symposium, and she was great, and I was so thrilled that she agreed to be part of today's presentation as well. Um, following Caroline, we'll be joined by Caitlin Wright. She has a professional background in land use planning and historic preservation. She's the founding executive director of the Greater Syracuse Land Bank, which incorporated back in 2012. The Land Bank acts in partnership with the city and county to address tax delinquent, vacant, and abandoned properties. So Caitlin will be focusing on um, how land banks can in engage with preservation to turn some vacant properties into affordable housing. Uh, then we'll hear from Darren Scott. He is the Upstate East Director of Development for New York State Homes and Community Renewal. He previously worked for the Albany Housing Authority and has assisted local governments and stakeholders to improve quality of life through the development of affordable housing. Darren is going to be sharing his expertise about funding structures and opportunities that kind of help bridge some of these gaps. Um, Brett Garwood will be our final panelist. He is the CEO of Home Leasing based in Rochester. He was previously a senior vice president at Homes and Community Renewal, where he oversaw the development and implementation of affordable housing finance and development programs. Brett's also on the League's Board of Trustees, and we're excited that he's going to be joining us today to talk about some of the current programs that Home Leasing is working on that fall into this category of affordable housing. And then after Brett's presentation, all of our panelists will be joined by Kevin O'Connor. Kevin is CEO of Repco uh, based in Kingston. They are the region's leading provider and advocate for quality affordable housing and community development programs aimed to provide opportunity and revitalize communities. Their projects often incorporate historic preservation best practices. Um, one great example of that, uh, the photo that you saw at the very beginning of the presentation on that slide, um, that was part of their East End Apartments of Historic Newburgh project, which actually won an award from the League back in 2019. A fantastic example of how land banks, preservation, and affordable housing can all come together to make something really great and help build a stronger community. So we're excited that Kevin will be moderating the conversation for us today. Um, as our, present, our, as our presenters are going through um, their slides, and if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box. Uh, once Kevin takes over for the conversation at the end, he'll be incorporating as many audience questions as possible. So please drop them there. If you have general comments, um, more general questions that I just might be able to answer for you, you can feel free to drop those in the chat. I will be there to help um, share links, clarify anything. Um, as I am able. Um, otherwise, please drop questions in the Q&A and we are looking forward to a really great conversation. We're so excited that you are joining us today. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Caroline. Hello, everybody. Oh, here we go. Okay. okay. There we go. Oh, 
Okay. So just to make sure that everybody is seeing what they're supposed to be seeing. Um, and if you're not, please let me know. Um, as Katie said, uh, thank you so much, Katie and the organization for inviting me to talk about this incredibly important topic um, within preservation and affordable housing. Um, conversations about, you know, joining preservation and affordable housing have been um, growing for some time. Oh, give me one second. Katie just said that you're seeing a different one here. Let me stop. Sorry about that. Is that better? Or are you still seeing presenter mode? Still presenter mode. Okay, sorry about that. I'll try one more time. It's worked before, but. Okay. How's that? Perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Um, as I said, conversations about preservation and affordable housing have been growing for some time. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that just, it's a great kind of growth in the development of the field. Um, I do want to take a step back um, before we dive into kind of the nitty gritty of what that looks like and kind of look at preservation um, within the context of affordable housing, but with a broader view on looking at some of the challenges that joining preservation and affordable housing have experienced and why it's been up till now kind of a um, a not unpopular view, but one that just has not is not very common or that some people still feel kind of uncomfortable with. So uh, just to start off um, talking about um, something that I'm calling, an, you know, the advancement of an equity preservation agenda that preservation up until now, and I, I think till now has an image problem, you know, in the early days, um, we talked about preservation being, you know, kind of an elitist and representing monumentalism narratives of these dead white men. And you only really need to look at, you know, headlines um, of about preservation to really understand that this, the discipline is still accused of being very uh, exclusionary and elitist and, you know, sort of opposition in opposition to equity. People don't necessarily automatically think of, um, you know, preservation is working in tandem um, with affordable housing. So, you know, and preservation's supporters and its critics, we, they increasingly demand uh, a greater inclusion of minority and marginalized communities within the preservation process um, to ensure fair distribution of preservation's, you know, costs and its benefits. And I really think that, you know, given the current climate of political and social change that we're undergoing right now, ignoring this opportunity within the field would be a, a great detriment to, um, to the development of the field. Uh, and, and it would really substantiate accusations that the field is incompatible with affordable housing um, and larger issues of equity. When in reality, uh, if we kind of just, you know, stretch our, our boundaries a little bit and we can understand and we can see that preservation can contribute rather than detract from equity and justice, especially within the realm of uh, affordable housing. So, you know, the question though is how, right? You know, how do we do this? It sounds like a nice lofty idea, but how do we, you know, get people to be comfortable really with this idea of preservation and affordable housing? And um, I've sort of, you know, I've been saying that, you know, equity preservation, this approach, it's a process through which these historically marginalized groups, they exercise greater participatory agency in the process, in the placemaking process. Um, and it works towards distributive and sometimes reparative uh, justice and parity um, within the process as well as the outcome. So, you know, on both ends of the entire uh, preservation affordable spectrum, affordable housing spectrum rather. Um, and if we can encourage this kind of approach, I really do think that preservationists uh, can enable outcomes that really do provide a counter narrative to the field's perceptions of elitism and exclusion that I just mentioned, um, and place preservation really at the forefront of current conversations around social justice and equity as we move forward. Uh, so again, you know, what does that look like? But how? It's this big question, but how do we do this? Uh, so, um, one of the things that I, the, the main tool that I'm going to be talking about today as a potential solution or response rather, not solution to this question of how to increase equity in historic preservation is um, through the lens of affordable housing is community land trusts. 
Uh, so just a quick, you know, the, the our, com our panelists that are coming up are, you know, much more well versed in this um, and the challenges facing affordable housing in New York. But I wanted to give you kind of a an overview of the challenges that the state is facing right now. You know, uh, less than, um, or I'm sorry, uh, the, there's almost there's. Um, 30% of the population in New York City is extremely low income, which means that uh, they have 30% um, 30 or, 30 or less, excuse me, um, or equal to uh, the area, area median income in the state. 28% are renters, uh, of renters are in that category. Um, there is more a dearth of more than 600,000 available rental homes in the region. And as you can tell, you, a, a household, um, would need almost seventy thousand uh, dollars in annual household income to find a rental home at fair market value. So there is a significant uh, set of challenges facing affordable housing in the state. Um, so with that, just I, I'll give a brief overview, I think, of uh, community land trusts and what they are for those of us who are not um, familiar with how they work. Um, so in this context, um, as I think Katie and probably others will be talking about, there's a variety of different kinds of land trusts. So what we're gonna be talking about today is specific to uh, housing and community land trusts, um, which are used to preserve and protect affordable housing. And it does this by separating the value of the land from the building on top of it. So it's an institutional arrangement in which a group of people, usually citizens or nonprofits, and sometimes the government, create a trust that owns the land, but sells the house on top of it or rents it um, or creates rental housing. Um, and in an ownership model, the homeowners buy the home or the structure at an affordable price um, and with restrictions on the use and the resale of it. So the buyers are engaging in a long-term lease of the land, and that's usually around 99 years, uh, with the actual title to the land held by the trust. Now, by doing this, this does two things. It lowers the purchase price and preserves the long-term affordability of the house when it compares to market rate increases. But for the homeowner, when they sell the house, they recoup the in increase in value and any increases from improvements that they have done to the house itself. Now, often written into the CLT arrangements are requirements or opportunities for counseling, education, financial classes, or other tools to kind of level the playing field for those buying into the community land trust themselves. So there's an educational component to it as well. Uh, so some of just the communal benefits for it. Um, I won't read, you know, I won't read all of these, but um, basically expanding access to home ownership specifically in the home ownership model. Um, it helps low and moderate income households um, become homeowners, especially in communities where market rate homeownership is elusive. Um, uh, it preserves access to home ownership and is a way to maintain affordability for many, many years. Um, it enhances security of tenure. So especially for first time homeowners, it helps them succeed. And um, in most of those models, there's shared responsibilities and pooled risks and a willingness to kind of intervene in times of trouble on the part of the CLT as well. Um, so such, such enhancements um, are really, they, they kind of backstop the home ownership opportunities that a public agency or private sponsor may have worked really, really hard and spent so much time to create. Um, from a broader perspective, it really stabilizes neighborhoods. It stabilizes property values, protects home ownership, pre pre prevents displacement, especially in neighborhoods where government has kind of instigated change. We think about gentrification models. Um, and it, on a personal level, you know, it, it builds personal assets, as we've mentioned, um, and it creates social capital, protects public assets, um, and expands civic engagement and mobility. Um, and it promotes development and diversity, especially if it's in kind of a, a mixed income population. So why CLTs and preservation, right? How do these kind of mix together? Uh, simply put, when we look at a lot of housing stock that is you know, ripe for affordable housing, it's old. Right, some of it may not be designated as historic housing um, or you know sort of landmark historic housing specifically, but it tends to be on the older end of things, and uh, a lot of it does have historic value. And so CLTs can help address the displacement associated with things like gentrification or rising property values, 
by providing affordable housing and simultaneously retaining this historicity of housing stock. So on the on doing so on the preservation end, we're also going back to my earlier point, countering these kind of elitist perceptions of the field, right? Uh, so just one quick example of um, the oldest uh, and first housing trust in the country, actually, Champlain Housing Trust. Some of you might be familiar with it. Um, so the Champlain Housing Trust founded in 1984, and um, it covers actually three counties in, uh, um, in the state of Vermont. Uh, and when I interviewed um, Brenda Torby, who was the executive director and has now moved on, she did explicitly say that, you know, preservation or um, without pres saying preservation explicitly, it's part of the work that they do, right? They're part of the community and history is part of that. Um, but at the end of the day, their primary goal and their primary mission is to provide affordable housing, right? So preservation is, excuse me, it's kind of a secondary goal, but one that they do recognize is an important part of the work that they do. Um, just again, you know, Champlain Housing Trust, it's the largest CLT in the nation. Um, they have more rental um, options than they do home ownership, but that is part of the work that they do. Um, now, what they do is that they recycle an initial subsidy to subsequent buyers with no additional public subsidy um, through these resale restrictions. And actually, two thirds of their sellers to go on to buy in the private market, the non CLT market. Um, and as a group, uh, as a CLT, their rate of foreclosure is uh, more than 10 times less than what you actually see in the market. Uh, a number of their projects are focused on people coming out of homelessness, abusive relationships, or in need of social services. So in this way, you know, CLTs are um, providing both preservation and affordable housing and a great social service as well. So they're providing access to housing markets, physical spaces um, that may have been barred to these households before in terms of, you know, the location of the homes themselves and access to work and, and jobs. So it's really kind of shifting the balance towards economic and social and physical equity. Um, so I will um, just kind of wrap up with that brief introduction um, by saying at a practical level, you know, we need to make sure that CLTs and whatever kind of tool we're looking at that really do join preservation and affordable housing are a good fit, one, for the market and the governance conditions within the state, the city, the region, whatever kind of uh, in, uh, institutional environment you're in. And there need to be checks and balances along the way. You know, CLTs are not a panacea by any mean and means, and these tools are not perfect. Um, but I do think that when CLTs and other tools are used thoughtfully and deliberately and with care towards inclusion of populations that are in need of affordable housing, um, and you know, they create opportunities or services um, along the way that encourage equity where it's lacking um, and that local communities are being privileged that tools like this can, can really facilitate um, equitable outcomes within a kind of more um, equity-based preservation agenda. So I will stop here and turn it over to uh, Caitlin Wright, again, of the Greater Syracuse Land Bank. Thanks, Caroline, I appreciate it. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen here. Uh, and thank you to the Preservation League for inviting me to participate today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm the director of the Syracuse Land Bank here. We serve all of Onondaga County in central New York. Um, our mission is to um, remediate the problems of vacant and abandoned properties. Uh, and we do that mostly by taking title to vacant and abandoned properties through tax foreclosure and we need to get them uh, returned to productive use. Uh, so the land bank here was established in 2012. We didn't really get off the ground until 2013 uh, and start acquiring properties, um, but we've evolved quite a bit since then, uh, and I'll go through some of that in a minute. Uh, but mostly our model um, is to acquire these properties and to convey them to private buyers. Uh, mostly those are local buyers. I think about 89% of our buyers so far have been located right here in Onondaga County and most of those are in the city of Syracuse. Um, and we wanna screen them to make sure that they have the skills and the financial ability to handle the renovations uh, because we mostly sell these as fixer uppers. Um, we rely on the city and the county and New York state to provide some financing to run the land bank. 
Um, but we mostly rely on the private buyers to, to handle the renovations. And we kind of think of that as a way that we're crowdsourcing the cost of renovations uh, because we've sold over a thousand properties to date and there's just not enough public subsidy around uh, to cover the cost of all of those rehabs. And if there are private individuals that are willing and able to do so, then that's probably not an activity that we need to be subsidizing anyway. Um, so the city used to do auctions and had very little control over the outcomes and who was buying the properties or what they were gonna do with them. Um, so we view ourselves as an improvement over the auction that we can screen the buyers to make sure that they don't have any back taxes or code violations and make sure that they have the skills or that they're hiring the people that have the skills uh, to do these renovations uh, and that they have access to the financing needed to do the renovations in a timely manner. Uh, because we feel that we have a responsibility to the neighbors as well to make sure that this property that was a blight and an eyesore uh, gets cleaned up quickly. And because we take title proactively, we can do some preventive maintenance that wasn't possible before when these properties were just sitting on the seizable list and still privately owned. Um, and our buyers can access more traditional mortgage financing and construction financing. Uh, whereas when you're buying at an auction site unseen, those options aren't necessarily available to you. Um, we do sell to some nonprofit partners, and I'll talk a little bit about those partnerships in a minute, uh, but the vast majority of our sales are to individuals. Um, and we're generating about half owner-occupied housing and half rental housing. Um, for those of you not familiar with Syracuse, uh, we have a lot of extremely concentrated poverty, um, mostly on the south and west sides of the city, smaller um, cluster of that on the north side where we've had a lot of refugees relocate and uh, move to Syracuse over the years. Um, but about a third of our population is living below the poverty line. And so we think it is important to increase home ownership and we look for opportunities to do that and to help people into pathways to buying their own home. Um, but we also know that there's a big need for quality rental housing um, because many of our Syracuse residents just aren't ready to own yet. Um, and there's a lot of neglected rental housing in the city um, that we would rather see people moving into you know, high quality recently renovated um, properties that are, have been dealt with the lead paint hazards and things like that um, and not living in substandard rentals that are out there. Uh, unfortunately, there are many of them. Um, so here are a few examples of homes that have been renovated by our private buyers. Um, these are both examples where they were turned into rental properties. Um, a typical sale for us might be a $10,000 sale for a one or two family home. Um, and then the buyer might put $100,000 into renovations. Um, most of our homes here are detached wood frame houses that are one or two family homes. Uh, so this is pretty typical of what you're seeing here. Um, in some cases, we partner with affordable housing developers uh, and other nonprofits in town to sell homes move-in ready. Um, and so I guess I should, should have prefaced all of this by saying that I think in terms of kind of preservation in a, a macro sense that we wanna preserve our older building stock that has interesting character and architectural value, but isn't necessarily landmark eligible. Um, so thinking about preserving the neighborhood as a whole and our neighborhood patterns. Uh, and that's mostly what we do is saving houses that are old, but not necessarily landmarks. Um, and in a minute, I'll talk about some landmark eligible properties that we've addressed. Um, so working with our affordable housing partners, uh, we're able to sell homes that are fully renovated or, and some new construction um, that are move-in ready. And I think that that helps a lot of our buyers. Um, many of the buyers that come to us that wanna purchase homes to live in, uh, don't do this full time. They've got a day job somewhere else and maybe they've never done a gut renovation before where you really need to gut the house down to the studs. Um, and so they really struggle with financing, with selecting and managing their contractors. Uh, and so we're working now on strategies to produce more move-in ready housing for those buyers, um, just so that we can save them some of that headache and ensure that we're getting better quality outcomes for the renovations. Um, since 2013, we've brought in over $10 million of grants from the New York State Attorney General's Office for the creation of affordable housing. Uh, we've used a lot of that money to demolish blighted houses. And unfortunately, about 30% uh, of the structures that the city forecloses on are demolition candidates. And it pains me to have to take those down, um, but they usually have fire damage or extreme water damage or structural damage, and they're just not feasible to be saved and they're dragging down the values of the surrounding homes. Um, so we think it makes sense to get those out of the way so that the surrounding home values 
can at least stabilize and that will help us attract people to come by and renovate those homes um, who otherwise might not want to renovate a home next to a burned out house. Um, so of the other 70% that are renovation candidates, um, we have selected quite a few of those and fully renovated them in partnership with home headquarters. Uh, and then we've also asked home headquarters to do some infill construction to fill in the gaps where there were homes that were demolished. Again, kind of preserving that neighborhood pattern and streetscape. Um, here's an example of a home that we were able to renovate with some grant from, grants from the New York State Attorney General's office. Um, this was an affordable housing grant um, that provided $100,000 of subsidy per unit. This is a three unit house. And uh, this was kind of an iconic home. Uh, it's on a main corridor on the north side that a lot of people pass every day. And many people had been watching it deteriorate for many, many years. Uh, that stone porch was pretty well known. At one time it had a second level on it. Um, and unfortunately, even with that much subsidy, we weren't able to finance reconstructing the porch, but we were able to stabilize this house and make sure that it'll be around for another hundred years. Um, and then we were able to sell it to a neighbor who lives nearby. You know, he's managing these three affordable rental units um, and catering to the refugee population. And he hopes that as time goes on, he'll be able to finance uh, reconstructing that second floor porch. Um, here's another example of some homes that we did with home headquarters using um, the AG's affordable housing dollars. Uh, the one on the left was a renovation and the one on the right was new construction where we had previously had to demolish a house. Um, and this is an example where that funding allows us to fill in the missing gaps where we've had to do demolitions in the past and kind of preserve the character of the neighborhood. Uh, this is all kind of small P preservation, um, not significant enough that we would have to go in front of the Landmark Preservation Board to get their blessing. Um, to date, we've acquired 2,000 properties, close to 2,000 properties and sold 1,000. Um, we're leveraging a lot of private investment. Like I said, we think of this as kind of crowdfunding neighborhood revitalization. Um, over $40 million in private investment. Um, and we've returned a lot of properties to the tax rolls, uh, generating uh, about, well, helping the city to better collect delinquent taxes uh, because they're able to divert properties to the land bank. People take the tax collection process more seriously and they've significantly increased their collection rates. Um, so that benefits them and justifies why they should finance the land bank so that we can continue to generate these good results for the neighborhoods. Um, another kind of small P preservation activity that we're involved in right now is architectural salvage. Um, many of our buyers are low income. And as you've probably seen in the news, the cost of building materials is rapidly escalating since COVID. Um, and so we'd like to salvage as much as we can from the houses that have to be demolished so that we can make those materials available to our buyers. Uh, not only is it a more cost-effective option for them when they're rehabbing other land bank homes, uh, but we think it's really important to preserve the character of those homes. Most of our buyers uh, do care about the historic character of the homes that they're renovating. And because they've been vacant, abandoned homes for quite some time, they've been a little beat up. Uh, there's been some vandalism. You might often see that spindles are missing from the banisters or doors are damaged. Uh, and people call me all the time looking for a particular size door or a particular pattern of a spindle or a cast iron heat register that's missing. Um, so if we can help people find those missing parts, I think that's an important way that we can help preserve the character of our remaining building stock. And um, we're doing more and more of this salvage prior to demolition to make sure that these things are not going to the landfill. Uh, and we're working on a plan right now to open up an architectural salvage store here in Syracuse that would um, connect our buyers with these materials. These are kind of the types of things that we're salvaging. Um, and now on to big P preservation. Um, this is known as the Ethel Chamberlain House. Uh, now, at the time when we got it through tax foreclosure, it was just 664 West Onondaga Street, um, an early 1900s apartment building built on a main streetcar suburb uh, that would, or a streetcar line that would have connected into downtown Syracuse. Um, it was really a grand apartment building at one time, but has def you know, definitely fallen on hard times. And the roof was nearly about to collapse when we acquired it through tax foreclosure. And we were approached by Housing Visions, thank goodness, uh, and they expressed an interest in saving this building. Um, we did believe that it was eligible for National Register listing. And uh, the corridor itself had been looked at in the past by the SHPO's office, but they thought that it had lost too much integrity. Uh, there have been quite a few demolitions on the corridor, replaced with some kind of uh, icky looking 1990s new construction apartment buildings uh, that really stuck out like sore thumbs. And so the district did not move forward. Uh, but Housing Visions was able to move forward with an individual nomination for this building. 
um, which we had suggested to other developers too, but they didn't think that it would be feasible uh, just with the historic rehabilitation tax credits. Uh, they had to combine it with other funding sources. So Housing Visions was able to partner with uh, Salvation Army. They had a women's shelter in another building that needed to relocate into a more modern facility. And so the ground floor is a 15 bed women's shelter and the upper floors are now uh, apartments for women that are transitioning out of homelessness. This is an $8.2 million renovation. They ended up having to build a new structure, a new steel structure inside the brick shell to support this roof. Um, and they used the historic rehabilitation tax credits, but they also used a variety of state funding sources. And I'm sure that Darren Scott, who I'm gonna turn it over to here in just a second, um, can talk about some of those other state funding sources. Um, but this was uh, necessary for them to combine both sources of financing to save this historically significant building. Um, and we're finding that in other places too, uh, as Housing Visions is looking at renovating this historic manufacturing building soon. Um, they're partnering with a private developer in this case. Um, but again, they're having to use a variety of different funding sources uh, in, from both the affordable housing world and from the preservation world uh, to get this done. So with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Darren from the New York State Department of Homes and Community Renewal who can talk about some of those funding sources that we are um, combining with historic preservation sources to make projects like this feasible. Thanks a lot, Caitlin. And uh, wow, that's, that's great work. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, I too wanna to thank the Preservation League for the opportunity to be on the panel today. Um, really happy to be joined by so many uh, experts in their field. And I think we have a lot in common. So um, quick uh, reintroduction of myself. I'm Darren Scott. I'm the Upstate East uh, Development Director for New York State Homes and Community Renewal. I've been with the agency for uh, about four and a half years. And uh, I'm one of three development directors. I cover um, everything north of Westchester and Rockland County up to the Canadian border and out to, but not including, unfortunately, Syracuse. Would love to have Syracuse in my portfolio, but uh, maybe someday. My, uh, my colleague, Lenny Skrill, uh, is uh, doing a great job with that, to say the least. Um, yeah, and so uh, our job is to really represent the agency in all manners, uh, in all programs, but today we're going to focus on multifamily rental development, uh, which makes up, I would say, the lion's share of the agency's business. Um, but prior to coming to the agency, I worked for the Albany Housing Authority, as um, Katie had mentioned. Uh, I worked there for uh, over 20 years, and prior to that, I worked for a, a small nonprofit. So altogether about 25 years working in Albany's downtown neighborhoods. And you know, so there are some lessons that are, can be learned from uh, working in the trenches there. Um, I would say the biggest one, you know, these are neighborhoods, if you're not familiar, these are neighborhoods that have seen decades and decades of disenfranchisement and uh, disinvestment that leads to lots of vacant lots, abandoned buildings, uh, and it's predominantly uh, low income uh, sub neighborhoods that make up these neighborhoods. Uh, and many uh, residents don't feel like they have a future. Uh, that's the face of it. Um, but what I learned was that these neighborhoods have um, uh, latent value. Um, they, these are lifelong residents, they're essential workforce, uh, and these are also overlaid by historic districts. And so uh, with beautiful, beautiful architecture that just needs a lot of uh, TLC, uh, but they, they bring uh, an identity of place and also uh, these buildings attract resources, right? Housing, uh, or excuse me, historic tax credits. And, um, you know, so when I went to the state, uh, yeah, I kind of knew this already, but uh, when I came to the state, this, this sort of situation occurs all over the place. And so uh, there are a lot of lessons to be learned, uh, you know, from locality to locality about how people are doing things in their own community. Um, it also seems to me that there's a confluence of need and opportunity uh, here where we have a we have lots of surplus property, right? Um, these are historic buildings and um, these are low-income neighborhoods. 
So, and each of those uh, have constituent groups, you know, uh, advocacy agencies, if you will, uh, that can bring um, resources and attention to those issues. So how do we incentivize someone to take advantage of those opportunities? Uh, and when I was thinking about how to put this presentation together, I thought, well, let's not start with HCR, right? I mean, we're not the beginning of everything, uh, but it, the need really begins in the community and uh, with the folks who are working in the community. So I decided that let's frame this presentation around uh, you know, a land bank perspective. So um, just a quick uh, review of our objectives uh, that I hope to accomplish here. So I want to I want to just quickly go through some development basics. Uh, this might be too basic for our audience, but if you would bear with me, I think it's a good foundation. Um, so we're going to talk a, a little bit about finding and creating customers, which you know are developers of all shapes and sizes, um, bundling property and, uh, to into packages that are uh, easily digestible by the state. Uh, meaning that these fit into funding programs that have been created um, and work all over the state. And then uh, what, are those, um, what are those funding programs? Uh, second, I um, like to use some projects that have been um, financed through uh, public resources. Um, I've tried to put together a few projects that uh, involve land banks uh, and also I want to show you some projects that weren't necessarily uh, land bank pro projects or properties uh, initially, uh, but show you the breadth of preservation that the agency is involved in. And then finally, I wanna leave you with some funding um, links and some uh, my contact information because uh, I'm gonna be going through this slideshow fairly quickly and um, it's a, to me a conversation starter and I welcome you to contact me uh, and we can have a discussion about your specific ideas and your community. So first thing is how do we find um, developers? And first let's start with what is development? Development is the aggregation of resources, property and professional skills for the design and construction of housing that meets an identifiable market need. Um, what is the role of a developer? I think of them as the, the quarterback of a team. And so they're responsible for everything having to do with uh, getting a concept together all the way to renting up a project once it is uh, completed with construction. Um, they uh, are not experts in every field, so they need to build a team around them uh, uh, consisting of architects, engineers, uh, surveyors, uh, market analysts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it really is a team sport. Um, and just to note some of the other roles that are played by developers. Um, some are also builders uh, and managers of, of property and um, some are owners. Um, why do you need developers? Um, well, this, this is your customer base. And I'm not just talking about big developers, I'm talking about moms and pops and smaller uh, private develop developers too. Um, they, they're the ones who are going to acquire your surplus property and put it back into productive use in accordance, uh, hopefully in, the, in accordance with the values of the community. Um, so these are uh, some different types of potential developers. We have a developer community that uh, HCR works with that carries out our mission. Uh, they're very familiar with our programs. Um, we also, uh, through our Office of Community Re Renewal, work with non nonprofit housing providers, both in an urban context and rural context. Um, public housing authorities, very, very key to the mosaic of affordable housing around uh, the state, sometimes the only affordable housing provider in a community. Uh, these authorities uh, for the last 20 or so years have been going through this dramatic shift in how they do business, uh, breaking away from uh, HUD subsidy and uh, getting into uh, mixed finance development. And um, it's a more sustainable model that they're, they're getting into. And so the state is uh, welcoming them with open arms. Um, supportive service providers who want to provide housing as part of their mission. Uh, and also uh, market rate developers who are uninitiated to uh, state financing. And again, these can be 
uh, companies or they can be individuals. Bundling property. So, um, you know, I know land banks have disposed of property in a number of different ways. Often the uh, amount of property outstrips um, the demand for it. Uh, so I've been working with a few land banks to uh, talk to them about, you know, the kinds of projects that the state finances and to talk to them about, well, how can you put together enough property uh, in order to uh, fit into one of our funding, our typical funding buckets. So um, developers, you know, when they're looking for property and they're going to come to your land bank, they're really looking for predictability. Um, they have you know, lots of things going on. They, they have limited resources like everybody, including time. Um, they want to make sure that, you know, when they put a dollar in, in the first minute or a couple hours into something, that there's going to be a return for that investment. So we want, and we want them to be successful in your community. So what are they looking for? They're looking for a, sing, a single property with uh, enough capacity for these different uh, uh, unit uh, counts. Um, they're looking for vacant lots, but they're also looking for historic buildings because they do bring uh, financial value um, to the deal. Uh, they're looking for markets with um, a high demand for the type of housing that they're going to propose. They want good local government. Uh, they're going to have to go through an approval process. And um, it's really good when there's a foundation of a neighborhood um, specific revitalization plan that the locality has promulgated, um, uh, hopefully with the in, uh, open involvement of the community, um, they're going to have to get their uh, zoning and uh, site plan approval. All these things take time. All these things uh, introduce a level of uncertainty into those projects. And so when you have a government, a local government that's bought into the concept that they need affordable housing, they want to see their neighborhoods revitalized, uh, it is a huge, advantage. Uh, property tax abatement, um, these uh, affordable housing, supportive housing, uh, by their nature have uh, below market rents. And so they don't generate a lot of cash they don't, or income. So uh, we have to keep their, uh, their costs, uh, their operating costs as low as possible. So we really look to the localities uh, to be our partner you know, the state will fund 80 to 100% of, uh, of these projects uh, on, in the development phase, but then when they go into operating, we need a partner uh, who can uh, come to the table and reduce those uh, property taxes. And then of course, um, the developers will want to conform to the state's funding priorities because at the end of the day, they're going to come to us uh, for funding uh, their project. What does HCR want? So we want all the above uh, that I just mentioned, um, but we also want neighborhood specific revitalization plans. Um, we don't wanna be working in a vacuum necessarily. Uh, we feel like uh, we have limited resources as does everybody. And uh, we want to deploy them in a place where they're going to resonate. So we're going in, especially in upstate um, localities where there are uh, diverse needs, um, you know, there's blight, there's uh, brownfields, there's, um, you know, issues that prevent uh, neighborhoods from thriving. And so when we can use our housing dollars to also, um, you know, take care of some of those ills, then, uh, and we have other economic development and, and um, you know, employment initiatives and so forth happening all around that housing investment, then uh, we, uh, we as a team, uh, a community can uh, move the ball down the field that much better. Um, we want to be yeah, have our uh, residents uh, living close to essential goods services and amenities, um, just like I want in my neighborhood. Um, you know, I have uh, maybe a little bit more choice uh, because of my income, but you know, for folks who don't have the same range of choices, um, they really need to be close to these good services and amenities and also in close proximity to public transportation. Uh, below market real estate, that's always a plus. Uh, the cheaper the property, the more resources we can put into the buildings. Uh, and we also want to see our uh, applicants or we call them sponsors, um, 
uh, leverage other federal, state, and local resources. That helps us stretch our dollar. Uh, we need to produce as many units around the state as possible with the resources we have. When we have partnerships, uh, financial partners, we're able to do that much more. So these are the, the primary, you know, the four big buckets, I guess you could say. Um, and I'll get into the, the programs in a minute, but um, the biggest program really is the 4% low income housing tax credit program. And this funds, in, and these are just general numbers, but generally 80 units and above, it's more like hundred units and above. And the uh, 80 to hundred uh, range is uh, a little bit debatable. Uh, you could fund it through the 9% program or the 4% program, depending upon the circumstances involved in any specific project. The 9% Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, um, it can fund uh, projects of 40 to 80 units. Um, small Building Participation Loan Program, this is a relatively new program, light removal program is targeted for uh, five to 40 units. And then we have a uh, smaller fund called the Community Investment Fund uh, for both rural and urban uh, projects. And this can fund five to 20 units. So where does the money come from? Um, HCR, so we are, we serve New Yorkers by uh, fostering the creation and preservation of affordable housing. Uh, we work strategically to revitalize neighborhoods and communities as you know, is in a part of our name. And uh, in all aspects, we promote fair housing opportunity. Uh, HCR is actually a conglomeration of agencies. Uh, each one does something different all around uh, the affordable housing space. And um, our role, as I was alluding to before, uh, we are a finance agency. Uh, we try to incentivize the development of affordable housing and supportive housing and related non-residential space. Uh, HCR doesn't develop. Uh, we don't own or manage affordable housing. Uh, our funding is shaped to meet state housing priorities. Um, the developer community carries out those priorities and um, you know, our primary mission is uh, serving low income and special needs population, populations, but uh, we always try to do it in a mixed income, mixed use uh, development in every kind of situation around the state. So the largest of the multifamily programs, these are the two primary funding paths. Um, these provide financing and um, capital for uh, you know, to promote the affordable housing opportunities for low income uh, residents and moderate income residents. Um, the, as I mentioned, the 4% uh, program, this is an open window program, meaning you can apply anytime. Uh, and then the 9% program is a uh, competitive process. And the next slide, we should get into that a little bit more. Um, so the Open Window RFP, this is administered by our Housing Finance Agency, or HFA. Applications are accepted on a rolling basis for first mortgage financing, 4% low-income housing tax credits, state low-income housing tax credits, and gap financing in the form of low interest and capital subsidy loans. The uh, Just a quick note on the uh, capital subsidy loans. This is like a menu of um, gap financing. Um, it's really, it helps um, tailor these big programs to the specific population and the specific needs of your community. Uh, typical project characteristics, 80 plus units, new or moderate rehab. These work, these, uh, this financing tends to work best in high rent markets that support debt uh, or for historic rehab and uh, adaptive reuse projects in qualified census tracts. Uh, the Small Building Participation Loan Program. This is an open window resource. Uh, you can access it without uh, getting into, you know, the bond and, you know, 4% low income housing tax credits. So this is a great program for newbies who, uh, you know, don't have that experience and want to do projects that wouldn't attract uh, an investor in, in, those, uh, in those projects. Uh, it's a blight removal program. Uh, meant to uh, for rehab and adaptive reuse of five to 40 units. It can be a single property or 
Uh, it can be scattered site. And the way it works is you can apply for um, capital subsidy uh, per unit. Uh, there are different affordability levels. So depending on how deep of, uh, the affordability you want to go, you can get either $50,000 or up to $75,000 per unit. Sadly, that's not gonna be enough. <laughs> and so the program is meant to work with our partner, the Community Preservation Corporation, which is a CDFI mission-driven lender. Uh, the program isn't exclusive to them, but they know all the ins and outs of it. Uh, they provide the permanent debt uh, that you know, will give you the, um, the, the resources to complete the rehab of this project. Uh, and uh, one of the really nice things about it is that they will also provide the technical assistance to that, uh, to that newbie so that, they can, uh, that they're more likely to be successful. Uh, the Rural and Urban Investment Fund, the residential use of this is for new rehab and adaptive reuse of up to five, uh, five to 20 units in localities with populations of less than 25,000. So uh, this, this is the majority of the localities in New York State. So it's, it's a lot of um, opportunity there. Uh, can it be used to fund also the non-residential component of mixed use affordable projects? The uh, 9% Low Income Housing Tax Credit, RFP. This is a competitive single source request for proposals um, and which offers the credits, but also the state low income housing tax credits and also uh, as the 4% uh, path, uh, the same sorts of uh, gap financing in the form of low interest uh, capital subsidy loans. Uh, they typically are 40 to 80 units. Uh, because the 9% credits, the equity from that is so rich, it, it it's, uh, allows for a deeper dive into buildings that need either demolition and new construction or uh, gut rehab. Uh, it works better in weaker markets that can't support permanent debt. Um, then, you know, it, through this funding path, there's also an opportunity to do smaller sc uh, scale projects. Uh, without the tax credits, um, roughly 20 units, uh, and uh, it, you apply for only uh, the, the, the capital subsidy. In this case, it's the Housing Trust Fund. Uh, and again, that's not going to be enough to do a project. And so uh, typically, uh, sponsors will uh, access other funding from other state agencies, uh, depending on you know, who the population is being housed. Uh, and uh, or, uh, or or private equity or debt. A quick run through of our state housing goals. So we try to focus our resources. Uh, we try to focus our developer community and how to use our resources. I should say, um, this is feedback from what the need we've seen around the state. Um, and so I've uh, kind of cherry picked a few that are relevant to this presentation. The first is community renewal and revitalization. Uh, and on, in that, so we want, we want, again, to be working within a context, a supportive context where there's neighborhood planning. Uh, and so, but uh, some subcategories that we're looking for is we want uh, the applicant to demonstrate site control of land acquired through a land bank. Um, and, uh, or to demonstrate the donation of one or more of the project sites from the municipality in which the project is located. Workforce opportunity, that's another name for transit oriented development. So, um, you know, our qualified allocation plan and our scoring matrix uh, that results from that all, you know, have this slant towards um, the urban environment. And this is where the need is, this is where the opportunities are. So these um, goals uh, tend to, you know, reflect that those priorities. Uh, state economic development. Uh, so this is in tandem with our regional economic development councils. Uh, they uh, manage the downtown revitalization initiative. Um, the Esprit communities, I know Albany and Newburgh are Esprit communities and also Brownfield opportunity uh, program. Um, so those are uh, goals, those are thresholds. As a, an applicant, you have to meet at least one of those goals to get in the front door. Um, and as far as scoring, um, these are some of the uh, scoring advantages that you can shape your project around. 
uh, again, neighborhood specific re revitalization planning, the proximity to good services and amenities, consistency with historic character and density of the neighborhood. Uh, local support, we always like uh, the locality to help out. Uh, participation of nonprofit organizations. These are all uh, points that you can get that will uh, give you an advantage in a uh, competitive funding environment. Reuse of historic buildings and the use of historic tax credits. So I'm not gonna go through this, but you can see on your screen, there are four different ways that you be, can be eligible for these points. And then financial leverage, as I mentioned before. So um, that's the medicine. Here's uh, some of the, you know, the, the good stuff uh, that results from a lot of hard work that our uh, developer community puts in and when applying to HCR. I'm going to start with um, a great project down in Newburgh that was uh, done by Rupco. Uh, Kevin uh, O'Connor, our um, uh, uh, our moderator has allowed me to do the, his bragging for him. And so um, this is a uh, project of approximately 60 units, scattered site in a historic district, um, low income neighborhood again. Uh, and Newburgh uh, was one of those early land banks that kind of got it, you know, bundle property and put it through, you know, attract developers who are mission driven and want to uh, access state uh, housing financing. And so um, this is, these are some before and after photographs and maybe when we get into the uh, panel discussion, Kevin can give a little bit more color to this, but um, just beautiful, beautiful outcome. And I think, again, it resonates. This is, uh, this was on our um, lead slide, right? Uh, different angle uh, before picture, there's the completed uh, building. Uh, some more before photos. And hey Darren, this is Katie popping up yes. just to give you a time warning. Hand it off to Brett. Thank you. I could go on all day. So thank you for that. Uh, after pictures. Uh, this is part of phase two. So uh, Repco came in with um, uh, a, another application for approximately 60 units, scattered site, lots of historic buildings, some new construction, and uh, the renovation, adaptive re reuse of a, a church that is going to be a community center, multi-purpose community center. I'm going to buzz through. This is some of my work, actually, uh, when I was in Albany. Uh, neighborhood stabilization program. Uh, there's actually a, uh, the building that we did is on the right. This is a land bank property on the left. Uh, another project that I did, larger project. This is an artist loft project. Uh, formerly abandoned school, converted it into an art center and a residential space for artists. And then these are some of the other preservation projects that I mentioned. Uh, here we have a project that Rupco did in Kingston, um, lace, lace factory, uh, another project under construction, Landmark Place in Kingston, another Rupco project, uh, Seville Senior Apartments, this is in Ravina. This is a former school in Albany that was converted into senior housing by Wind Development. This is a recently completed project, uh, Cap Rep Theater in Albany. This is a use of the Community Investment Fund. 444 River Street in Troy of the Sino Group project just completed. Uh, Hudson Art House, another Vicino project in Troy. This is a community builders project also in Troy, uh, Tapestry on Hudson, and another community builders project in Cohoes. This is what you're striving for. You want to bring your um, funders and advocates uh, to a groundbreaking, uh, but what's even better than a groundbreaking are ribbon cuttings. So time to celebrate all that hard work and uh, invite the community in. This is uh, what I'm going to leave you with. Uh, at the top is uh, access to uh, HCR's uh, uh, homepage. Multifamily programs can be found in the second um, arrow and then my contact information. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Brett now. Hi, thanks, Darren. Um, I'm going to share my screen.
Okay, is that visible to people? That works? That's yes? great. Okay, good, okay. Um, so uh, my name is Brett Garwood, I'm with uh, Home Leasing. I'm the CEO of Home, Home Leasing. For some reason, my, there it is. Uh, Home Leasing is a family owned and mission oriented uh, company. Uh, we are development, uh, we do development property management as well as a general contractor. We operate in New York, Pennsylvania and Maryland, but primarily in New York from Albany and bu to Buffalo, Oswego to Owego. We do a wide variety of project types. Um, you know, we do new construction, but we at, do at least a third, maybe almost half of our work is historic preservation. Um, we do some market rate work, but primarily our, our focus is on affordable housing. Uh, we've got 200 employees and we currently manage uh, just over 3,000 units. Um, and our construction company has about $100 million of work under uh, construction right now. Uh, we're a certified benefit corporation, so we are a for-profit company, but uh, we are very mission-oriented, and as a certified benefit corporation, we're really held to a high standard for our performance, our transparency, and accountability, including um, efforts to improve the quality of our uh, environment. Um, I'm going to principally focus on just giving a couple project examples in a little bit more detail, um, and I've got a project example that is a uh, they're, they're all historic tax credit projects, but I have a project example that's funded by the 4% low income housing tax credit program and one is the 9%. The first one is a 4% low income housing tax credit program in Albany and it's called Clinton Avenue Apartments. This is an after picture. Um, uh, uh, Clinton Avenue is an important street that goes up the hill from the river uh, origi originating uh, where um, uh, the Palace Theater is, and uh, it goes quite a bit uphill. Uh, we discovered this uh, um, portfolio of homes, uh, townhomes, that was in extremely bad condition. Uh, it was owned by one owner uh, from a transaction that happened uh, in the early 80s, um, and it was in great distress. There's 70 buildings, uh, 210 housing units, uh, but by the time we had seen it, it had uh, fallen in substantial disrepair. Uh, there were only about 80 tenants. Um, eight of the buildings were condemned. Uh, many more were uh, in very rough shape. Uh, about uh, 30 of the buildings were vacant. Um, and it was in foreclosure. It was about to go to uh, uh, a judgment of foreclosure uh, uh, that would have resulted in an auction. Um, this was a pretty scary moment uh, for the community because uh, you have very little uh, control of what happens when a property goes into auction and uh, a property like this falling in the hands of, a, of, a, of the wrong owner uh, would not be a benefit to the community. So we worked very closely with the first mortgage lender and uh, the land bank and uh, Capitalize Albany and the city of Albany to try to intercede and prevent the property from going into foreclosure by securing a purchase offer from the property owner, but also working with um, the lender to help pause the eviction or pause the uh, foreclosure while we tried to deal with the uh, uh, property. And this is one of the things that's important for uh, a project like this because it's so large, 210 units um, and the complexity of it. Um, it was important that we were a property manager as well as a developer and construction company. Uh, we needed to be able to manage the property immediately um, and we needed a construction company on staff to spend about six months crawling through these buildings to understand the, the scope of work because while they're all townhomes, each was different and each was unique. Uh, we uh, uh, financed this project with uh, HCR resources as well as historic tax credits. Uh, it was a two year construction period. Um, and we also had a component of supportive housing uh, that was introduced uh, using the vacant units with 40 units of services from uh, DePaul, which provides uh, help for people with mental illness who were threatened or faced uh, uh, homelessness. 
the total project cost was uh, $56 million. So it's a very, um, not just large project, but also quite expensive project given the condition of these buildings. And that's the trick with pairing historic preservation and um, low income housing tax credits. A lot of the properties that we um, take on are properties that are really threatened with um, um, no longer existing. Like these are, are projects that are important location, important buildings, but uh, could go away because of their very poor condition. So this is a long list of the programs that we used. Um, we also considered some other proper, uh, other programs, including the home program. Uh, shied away from that because it was another layer of reviews that would have delayed things. And we also worked with the local land bank to secure some additional properties, but ended up uh, not including those properties in this project, uh, saving them for a second phase because we were already dealing with a very complex project. Um, I'm just going to flash on the screen a little bit uh, the uh, sources and the uses for the project. It gives you a sense of the importance of the different components of how you fund a project like this. Uh, you know, historic tax credits provided more than $12 million of sources for the project, but also the uh, HCR low income housing tax credit even provided another uh, almost $20 million. Without one of these sources, there was no way that a project like this could have uh, could have occurred. Um, you know, you know, just kind of going through the benefits, uh, it kind of hits on some of the points that Darren made, which is we're trying to accomplish more than affordable housing here, and that's the type of project that we really like. Um, you know, we avoided the foreclosure and displacement. All the tenants who were in the buildings that uh, we took on. Uh, were provided an opportunity to come back to the properties after they were temporarily relocated um, during construction without facing a raise in rent. Uh, that was a very important part of the uh, goal of the project. So we created affordability, uh, affordable housing. Uh, we created mixed income housing. There's a wide range of rents here. Uh, there were some first floor commercial spaces that were renovated as part of the project. I mentioned the supportive housing component, but there's a big community uh, development component as well as Clinton Avenue is a street that other things are happening. It's, a, it's an important street where uh, these buildings were um, really helping to drag uh, progress down. You know, uh, the building was, um, or the buildings were entirely unregulated and that was one of the challenges is, um, we had existing tenants who were not used to being part of affordable housing programs and we were committed to keeping them as tenants and trying to uh, make the affordable housing programs fit um, uh, and work well with existing tenants regardless of their financial situation. We had a few tenants who were over income that we were able to figure out a way to stay um, and maintain that kind of mixed income nature of the property. What was interesting about a, a community like this is uh, there are several different community organizations. These, these 70 buildings are stretched along uh, almost a mile of the street uh, across several blocks. And you know, you go to some meetings and uh, people were most concerned about gentrification, that we were going to come in, renovate the buildings, jack up the rents, new people would move in who don't live there and people who currently live in the community would be priced out. Uh, we would also go to meetings where people would say that the big problem is concentrating poverty and we're gonna come in and we're gonna bring even more low income people into the community and further concentrate poverty. Um, and what's I think remarkable about the variety of programs that HCR our authors is that we were able to address both of these concerns uh, through this project. Uh, we were able to maintain housing for existing residents, create housing for very low income residents, create some housing for moderate uh, income residents who uh, provided more income diversity than is currently in the, build, uh, in the uh, neighborhood. But also uh, now we're entered into a regulatory agreement for uh, at least 50 years where um, the units and the incomes and the affordabilities will be maintained for the long period of time. So no matter what happens to the um, neighborhood, 
it'll always have this core of affordable mixed income housing, no matter what happens in the market. We are working on a second phase. Um, again, you know, trying to do more. Um, this second phase includes addressing yet another building, uh, which you see pictured here, four more townhomes and the infill of a portion of a block mm -hmm. that had uh, been demolished in partnership with the community loan fund, where we're going to introduce a substantial non-residential component for an incubator program that will expand from their existing program uh, adjacent to it. So we're really excited about the additional things to come in the uh, neighborhood. Um, challenges were many. Um, we have the most, most complex rent plan. Uh, every unit is different. Every unit is regulated differently. And it's a lot of uh, complexity to manage a property like this. Uh, the relocation was a real challenge. COVID hit during the relocation. Uh, and that made it even more challenging because we were unable to move people for a period of time. Uh, the complexity of the project made it so that some investors weren't able or willing to take a look at it. Um, we had a process with SHPO and NPS who are fantastic partners, but you know these are 70 individual nominating processes for each building. Uh, an enormous amount of uh, process and paperwork that we had to get through. Uh, overall, just the complexity of this project was the biggest challenge. The second project is the 9% version uh, of uh, a historic preservation slash low income housing tax credit uh, project. This is in Schenectady and it is just completed just very recently. It was a former school, uh, Catholic school, long vacant. Um, it was owned by uh, Schenectady and we worked with Metroplex and, their, um, and they have a land bank component to acquire uh, this property that was a real uh, fantastic relationship. Um, what brought us to this property was a partnership with Better Neighborhoods uh, Incorporated. It's now Better Community Neighborhoods Incorporated. They are a nonprofit uh, neighborhood preservation corporation that has consolidated with a community land trust recently. And what's really great about that um, partnership is uh, you know, they provide the knowledge and the experience with the community building, and we bring the expertise in development and the capacity to pull off a project like this. And the other thing that's exciting is that we are partnering with them on an ongoing basis towards a second phase, but they're active in the neighborhood doing the other things that need to happen to revitalize community like homeownership programs and addressing conditions of existing homes that are already occupied and working on community building activities. In this case, uh, we didn't just renovate this existing um, school uh, into housing. We also acquired the um, uh, a portion of a block uh, kitty corner to this property that was um, um, kind of a hodgepodge of different buildings in various states of decline and did an, uh, a demolition of those buildings and, and built a new project, a uh, new construction project that had some commercial component. You'll see an image of that soon. So this was just completed about a $20 million project. Um, on the upper right here, you'll see a photo of the new construction project that was built. And the photo below is the next uh, phase, uh, the Elmer School, which is down the street, which was a public school that has been uh, uh, closed for a few years, and we're working to advance that as the next project. Again, a lot is accomplished besides just creating affordable housing. You know, we repositioned these uh, vacant buildings. Again, create affordable housing, mixed income, community development, and historic preservation. Um, and we're really excited about, you know, the other things that we're, our partners are able to do in this community to help work with the city and, and address the community more holistically. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just a few slides of other projects. There's lots of examples. This is Eastman Gardens in Rochester. This had been vacant for 30 years, had been a dental dispensary and education center for the University of Rochester. And its best use for those last 30 years was as a, um, as a haunted house at Halloween and was otherwise vacant. Um, the gardens at St. Anthony's in Syracuse. This project is almost complete. 
um, again, another Catholic school uh, campus that had no longer been used. Um, and we're renovating that into senior housing. And our most uh, recent uh, addition to this list is the Huntington Building. We'll start construction of this uh, this fall. The upper left shows the existing conditions, and this is a rendering of what it will look like. This was a yeast factory, um, uh, you know, in the late 1800s, had become a car dealership and uh, was vacant. Uh, at some point in the history of the building, um, the mansard roof was taken off, and we were able to recreate that mansard roof uh, and benefit from historic tax credits to revitalize this for affordable housing that will include a veterans supportive housing component. So there's a lot of examples. Uh, all these buildings has an uh, um, important place in their particular communities. And I think um, I'll wrap it up there just by providing those examples. And I think Kevin, I'm turning it over to you to share some uh, questions and comments. Okay, well, uh, thanks all, great presentations. Uh, I'm reminded of the adage, you know, if it was easy, anybody would do it. This is difficult work and uh, really spectacular. So uh, Katie, thanks for the opportunity to be a part of today. Uh, I think time's a little bit short, but uh, Caroline, I'll start with you. You, know, you talked about the um, equity preservation agenda and that perhaps, you know, over time there's been you know, perhaps a tad elitism here in preservation. Um, and, you know, I've read some of your articles about, you know, being intentional uh, for communities to, uh, to bring equity to it. Do you think that we're seeing preservation uh, occurring um, on both sides of the tracks and in, in, in communities of color? Um, are you seeing that? And if so, you know, um, can you point to some examples about that? Um, yes, I mean, we definitely are seeing preservation in communities of color, um, for sure. You know, here in Florida, um, where I am, and, you know, really not just in Florida, but throughout the country, we have examples of the communities um, of color actually, you know, leading the charge for, to preserve their own historic buildings. Um, and you know, preserve their own historic neighborhoods. Uh, some of the challenges that we run into is, um, you know, in, in a lot of these in a lot of these communities, there's an inherent distrust or mistrust of institutions, right? And and it's a mistrust combined with kind of you know they haven't really had a lot of opportunities to learn about you know low income housing tax credits, right? And learn about the complexities of how preservation works within the legislative and the bureaucratic side of things um, at an institutional level. And because there's this sort of inherent fear for a lot of communities, you know, it's, it's sort of hesitation. Um, so when it is when preservation does occur, you know, it's usually led um, by by individuals, you know, who have had those experiences and have had those avenues to learn about the different opportunities. But um, so, you know, I think uh, I think that one of the things that the preservation field as a whole needs to do is, you know, include uh, communities, um, whether it's communities of color or you know, lower income communities or any community that really hasn't had access to the know how of the nuts and bolts, right, of how preservation actually functions at a very practical level. Um, you know, we are kind of shooting ourselves in the foot or, you know, in the sense that, you know, we may walk the walk and say preservation is important, you know, for low income communities and, um, and you know, communities of color, but until those communities are really at the table and in part, and part of the process, right, from start to finish, not just consulted at the end, um, or I'm just sort of seen as like the customers of the project, right? You know, I think that it, the relationship is going to be kind of skewed, right? We need to kind of go a little bit deeper uh, and include these communities as part of the process, not just the outcomes. Um, if we really want to talk about holistic change that occurs at a community level. Thank you, Caroline. Caitlin, um, wow, um, quite a a uh, number of properties you've gone through in, uh, in a few short years. Um, you've worked with a number of customers. Um, we talked about half maybe going towards ownership, half maybe going towards landlord rental. How is preservation viewed 
by your customers coming to the land bank? Is it looked upon as a good thing, a problematic, pain in the ass? Uh, how is it looked upon? Well, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting mix of opinions. Uh, so frankly, many of our buyers want to avoid landmark properties. Uh, they are afraid of the hassle of going to the Landmark Preservation Board. They just assume that it's going to come with a lot of regulations. Um, we have proactively nominated a lot of our properties to the National Register of Historic Places, thinking that that will help attract buyers who want to use tax credits. Um, so there's a lot of education for us to do, I think, um, with smaller developers about how the tax credits work and the fact that they get to choose if it's on the National Register. If they don't want to take the tax credits, then they're not going to be regulated. But if they do, then they've got to work with the SHPO. Um, so there's a lot of education to be done there. Um, that said, the vast majority of our properties are not listed. Uh, they're, they're old and they're interesting, but they're not necessarily regulated landmarks. Um, sure. And those really attract people. Um, they don't have any regulatory stuff to fear. Unfortunately, they don't come with tax credits, um, but Syracuse is a pretty affordable market. So um, sometimes that outweighs the fact that there are no tax credits. It's not like we're one of the Hudson Valley communities that's really gentrifying. Um, and in the past 18 months since COVID, uh, we're seeing a lot of downstate buyers relocating to Syracuse and buying some pretty cool old mansions uh, and renovating them to be their primary residence. Yeah. Um, interesting. Um, I certainly, uh, I mean, in some, in some circles, you know, the uh, uh, historic property landmark status has been looked upon as uh, could, you know, being potentially problematic. And of course, uh, for those who have figured out how to use uh, some of the resources, specifically the historic tax credit, um, you know, right now we have a 10% boost uh, in certain uh, census tracts on the New York State historic tax credit. So uh, in addition to a 20% federal tax credit uh, and a 20% typical New York State tax credit, we now have a 10% boost so you can get a 30% tax credit and uh, can really make some difficult projects very viable. Um, not to mention, uh, you know, really uh, preserve history to a certain set of standards. Is there a sunset on that boost? I, I think there is, but I can't tell you when it is. I don't know if anyone else knows, but uh, yeah, I believe it is a, a temporary um, situation. So Darren, given um, you know a somewhat finite set of resources that the state brings to, to the table of affordable housing and, and, and community renewal, um, what kind of you know challenges um, does historic preservation, scattered sites, some of the projects uh, that you've seen us do or, or that Brett has done, compared to uh, you know, new construction, a little tidier, a little neater, um, how does it uh, present challenges for, the, um, for, your, for your agency? Well, um, you know, we sort of have a bottom double line, right? We, we are mission driven, but we're also uh, need to be responsible with the deployment of, of scarce resources. And so, um, you know, it is, it is a tricky balance. You know, these more impactful projects can also be more expensive. Um, and so that's why, you know, the historic tax credit is really key uh, to help drive down that cost uh, for the agency. Um, change orders, you know, uh, you, you know, once you're out of the ground on a new construction project, then um, I think your change order threat, you know, reduces significantly well, on a historic rehab. Um, you know, you really have to do your homework up front uh, to figure out, you know, what are the what's behind that wall or, you know, get into that foundation that's been, uh, you know, left to rot for for decades, perhaps. Um, you know, so, so, you know, we try to be impactful. We go where the need is. Again, we try to um, uh, take care of problems while also providing housing. Uh, and sometimes it can be expensive and, and that cost of development can be difficult to defend sometimes uh, from a, you know, I think, you know, the scattered site nature of construction is more challenging. Uh, you getting local approvals, getting neighbors on board, you know, you have more property lines, more roofs, more, more of everything. So, um, and then from a management point of view, I think, you know, there's a certain limit to how scattered, uh, you know, these, these, uh, apartments can be and still effectively manage them. Great. So Brett, you mentioned uh, briefly the challenge of one of the uh, federal uh, funding sources, uh, home and, uh, 
So the world of um, uh, the Secretary of the Interior Standards and, 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 and the principles governing some of the historic preservation work, um, anything come to mind as uh, uh, suggested? Uh, do we need to change? Things are working just fine. Um, you know, are there a particular set of challenges? Anything you think in that realm? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think it, it's becoming ever more complex. I mean, I have to say the, the State Office of Historic Preservation has been a, a great partner with us. They are a solution oriented, right? Uh, National Park Service, uh, they, they have a good sense of what National Park Service will approve and what they won't, but that does change a little bit over time and predictability is important. But I, I, I think one of the challenges is um, it's really different in a high um, cost project when its context is a very distressed market compared to a kind of high end market. And, you know, we're mostly in the business of trying to save buildings from like demolition. And um, these ever increasing layers of complexity just result in ever increasing cost. Um, I think uh, a new area that is gonna, we're gonna experience this with, especially for historic buildings, is as we try to get buildings to be more energy efficient or all electric. Um, we're gonna have some issues of um, conflict uh, between trying to make a building uh, green and trying to meet the historic standards. And I'd like to figure out a way to do that where we don't just make it even more expensive. And that's uh, an iterative process that demands flexibility. And so um, I, I think the thing that I want most is, is more flexibility and uh, trying to be rational about getting to the broad outcome without getting caught up on some very specific things that can drive up costs, right? We're looking at a project right now and you know, in order to meet the historic standard and the energy standard, we might be spending uh, $4,000 per window. That's not okay, it's just too much money. Um, and so I think that's that's an area where, I guess I'd say flexibility is, is what I'd like to see. That's hard to regulate. <laughs> hey everybody, so I am popping back up just to say that we are about at time. Um, I know we went a little bit long, so I'm sorry that we didn't get more time to have this group conversation, but um, Kevin, I wanna, Kind of let you have the last word. Is there a last question um, that you want to pose to the to the panelists and and then to all of you? Um, anything you want to leave us with? Two things. Uh, I lament the lack of a financing tool to do home ownership in this realm. Uh, we often uh, partner the historic uh, sources with the low income housing tax credit. We're doing some really great projects in the rental world, and I hope that someday we get some financing tools on the home ownership side. Last question for the panel. Um, Gentrification is happening uh, across the country. It's happening in, in many of our cities in New York, um, particularly here in the Hudson Valley, for sure. Um, is historic preservation contributing to gentrification uh, or, or, or not? Anyone? I think it's a part of the solution. We need to produce more affordable housing and it's gonna come in the form of, you know, historic rehabs and new construction. We just need more of it. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's both, you know, I think sort of left unchecked, you will see, you know, more preservation projects that do contribute to gentrification, but, um, you know, I think with the right form of checks and balances and using opportunities and like combining different tax credits and, you know, per, uh, land bank, um, land trusts opportunities and different kinds of tools that combine preservation opportunities with, um, you know, other tools, whether it's tax abatements or, you know, any other kind of financial or regulatory tool to kind of check the, the you know, unmitigated um, impacts of gentrification, then preservation can be part of the solution. But I don't think we can, you know, wholesale say that it's for sure part of the solution without recognizing the other side of it as well. All right. Well, thanks all. I appreciate it. And uh, Katie, back to you. Right. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you to our panel. I, I so appreciate your time today and sharing everything that you know with, with the group that joined us. And thank you all for tuning in. 
Um, the league does programs like this pretty regularly, so hopefully you'll tune in for another one someday. Um, we will also have a recording of this one on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. So if you missed any part of it or you just want to watch it again, you can find it there. Um, and we just appreciate your support. The league is a nonprofit, so you all make the work that we do possible. Um, please stay in touch and thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thank you, thank you everyone. Okay, leave the morning.